welcome to Danish Policy. I'm Charlene. I'm Crispin. Uh, and today, I think we're going to talk about media and the shift towards podcasting, essentially, uh, into new media. I don't know. I just want to get your opinion of like, I'm finding nowadays that traditional media, like uh, TV shows, um, radio, people are using it less and less. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're shifting to mediums like this, as well as like YouTube. Uh, I just want to get your opinion. And why it's happening. On, yeah, and why it's basically happening. So, so first of all, everyone, please forgive the coffee. <laughs> Charlene <laughs> has somewhere to be later today and it is an absurd hour on a weekend morning. So I'm just going to keep this on screen if that's okay with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that early, okay, whatever. <laughs> well, it was early when we got up you know, <laughs> to get here. This, it takes a while to set all up the studio. Anyway, so... Um, to answer your question, yeah, I mean, look, t- traditionally, the the newspapers and you know the media conglomerates were these. I've got about newspapers? <laughs> That's how much. We don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I, I I know I know young people today. God, I know young people today. She called me old and wise the other day. It's so bad. Anyway, so um, can't even read like analog clocks. This is this is like my my con- you know millennial confounding device. I've got right here, and uh, they they would say it's a single single use tool. Um, so in other words, completely pointless to have as a, a permanent fixture. But then again, what's jewelry anyway? So newspapers they they have these. They used to be these massive conglomerate kind of institutions, mm. uh, and they would make huge amounts of money from um, from advertising, and and they were so. You know, massive as these monoliths that entire like stories would be built up around media outlets themselves. So you'd have shows about newspapers and 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 Superman and Clark mm. Kent and Lois Lane and all of this sort of stuff. That, that it, it was a massive fixture, much like we would imagine sort of Facebook and YouTube and things like that today. So big circulations mm. were enormous companies. And they had just an endless reign of money for, for advertising either on television or through their, their printing media. And so they primarily focused their attention on competing with one another for prestige rather than attention. Um, so they would all have huge investigative journalism budgets, thousands of, of reporters reporting on everything, digging into bits of research, secondary and third kind of groups of people that could find out various aspects of everything that was going on in any government or any area of, of high society. And so it was a, a much more trusted institution. Now, of course, they still had um, significant biases in their politics and, mm-hmm. um, and a politician who was wanted to have a career uh, was utterly dependent on the media because they they didn't have any other way to get their message out. So they had to sort of you know align with at least one distribution's sort of worldview in order to become promoted. So the the role that media played in in the um, the government of the day was was massive, um, and that also I think um, meant that because they could intervene, they often didn't. There was sort of a, a culture um, brought up through the generations of of sort of classic liberalism in the media. So journalists mm. would um, always print multiple sides of, of a point of view in order to um, uphold the, the integrity of journalism. Like journalism itself had an ethic that uh, that people kind of tried to respect and, and the more you did so and developed good and, and intriguing stories, the more likely you were to be picked up by places like the New York Times or Washington Post, one of the major conglomerate kind of um, uh, institutions. And so that that was kind of the the industrial age way of doing of, of doing the media, but then when the internet happened, there was just a massive revolution that has affected our whole society, and one must concede, you know, on balance, quite negatively. So originally, the the, the internet was this held it as this ultimate libertarian dream where people could communicate and share ideas instantly across the world no matter who you are where you're from um, across cultures and, and territorial boundaries and that the idea was that this marketplace of ideas would result in people um, having their preconceived notions challenged and and be able to progress human civilization by 
um, interacting on a much more more um, speedy and, and deeper level. The problem that happened with the media is that it decimated their um, income base, mm-hmm. right? So advertising shifted online. Um, it is much more cost effective for businesses to advertise through social media, um, through YouTube, uh, than it is through traditional you know, television and newspapers. Um, it's far more targeted. You can go straight to the audience that you're seeking to, to address um, and market your product at those that have a high probability of engagement. So that just gutted the income um, of all traditional media and destroyed their business model. Mm-hmm. So to reinvent themselves, they had to do a few different things. One, either they move to a subscription model where they appeal only to a specific audience. That, though, that audience doesn't get as many ads or anything like that, but they get um, you know, the, all of their income through their readership, right? Mm-hmm. Or they create a model where um, everything has to go viral, right? So if you have a, a news story that gets... A f- a squillion clicks online through Twitter, you know, going across the internet, mm-hmm. then you're much more likely to get significant advertising revenue from that particular product. But doesn't that, I guess, compromise the truth? Because I feel like traditional media, you know, had held that integrity of like journalism. But now with this shift towards being viral, it kind of compromises you know, what is what is real. <laughs> it, it doesn't just compromise it. It it, it fatally irradiates it, right? Mm. Because you've got um, uh, in both models, it's a disaster. Because in the first model, it's an echo chamber. You're, you're the people that are willing to pay money for you really just want to have their biases reinforced, right? Mm. So the the people that make up the institution will feed the machine of you know if you're a a, a rabid lefty. You'll feed all the kind of you know um, social justice stuff, and if you're a massive neoliberal, you'll you know feed all the taxes and individual freedoms and so on and stuff. Um, and and so people will be generated and motivated to pay money to an institution that is amplifying their ideas, right? Whereas in the um, viral model, it's a, it's equally bad but in a different way that you have these massive clickbait headlines with no investigative journalism model at all Mm -hmm. um, where it's all just commentary it Uh, and so you have this ridiculous outrage headline with ridiculous outrage opinion um, spreading virally across the internet either from people like saying isn't this outrageous and sharing it or people reacting to it and saying this is ridiculous isn't it outrageous and sharing it Mm -hmm. Um, so the the way in, like the cultural divisions that are happening in our society, and I think it is fair to call it a cultural war, um, is absolutely exacerbated and intensified by the the debilitating media landscape. Uh, and so, once upon a time, you would you know you would call the media the fourth estate, um, where it was an essential component of democracy that we ourselves as individuals could not have the opportunity to really get involved in these deep issues. Mm. And we relied on the media to inform us about the things that were ruling over our lives and affecting the way we live. Um, Nowadays, people do not trust the media. The media is the least kind of trusted institution. Where does that come from, that distrust? Well, I mean, there's there's two sides. One, the... um, conservative side of politics particularly in the united states has always been distrustful of the media particularly publicly funded media um, and then uh, but but on both sides now uh, there is significant hostility um, because they people are aware people are people know that this is what's happening in the media they may not articulate it in in this sort of historical journey of we've gone from here to here but they know that that there's rage bait click so, you know articles being written every day and that um, that there are media outlets that only publish one point of view like mm. and, and and what's terrible is is what's happened to what once great institutions right so um, like I said in, in a previous podcast the New Yorker once published Hannah Arendt's banality of evil they would never do that today right they they mm. just uh, they would not publish anything that went against a particular, grain of narrative they wouldn't upset their core readership base under any circumstances um and then what happened with the new york times is just extraordinary 
So they hired on their editorial board a, a young woman from Harvard um, who <laughs> had said all this kind of massively racist stuff over a course of years, not just like, you know, people getting upset one day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but because it was towards white people, she was forgiven and, and she put it now. I won't name who she was, but um, everyone can look it up. Um, and, and she's still there um, after several years. It's extraordinary. And then, and then the other day, well, a few weeks ago now, um, Senator Tom Cotton, conservative senator in the United States, published an op-ed in the New York Times. And this really divided the, the intergenerational aspect of the New York Times, the people who are in their 40s and 50s at the New York Times have the classical journalism values versus these um, social activists that are now making it up today, right? So Tom Cotton published an article that basically said that they should send in troops to put down rioters, right? Now, there is multiple points of view, but what you can say for that argument is that it is popular. They're like all the polls in the United States think that should happen, right? So even though it may be wrong, because not every popular opinion is the right opinion, right? And I, and I haven't, I'm not 100% sure what he means specifically, but the the reaction in the New York Times was one of absolute rebellion because it, it circled back on itself. What, what previously happened was that you would have these, an obligation to publish multiple points of view, yeah. right? Um, including conservative points of view uh, and with the, 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 the disclaimer that this is an individual opinion doesn't represent the views of the institution right um, and when you move to a subscription model they started speaking to a particular audience and only pushing a particular line and then people who were coming up through the universities would look at that and go oh I want to join that institution that just seems to publish that one point of view right so the young people who are moving into the New York Times don't have the same values as the older journalists. They, they, they see the New York Times as an instrument of social change, mm. not a journalistic tool to inform the public, right? Mm. And so what we've had is the editor of the opinion, a very esteemed journalist, um, resigned because of that Tom Cotton article, right? Mm. He just simply published the same thing that any self-respecting journal like newspaper publication would have published at any other point in history but because the sort of the younger journalists thought this was an outrage and they felt afraid by the words that Tom Cotton had said in the op-ed of the New York Times um, rather than simply publishing a rebuttal like any other yeah. institution should they they implemented their cancel culture to get rid of the senior staff of the New York Times and they've all resigned. I mean, it's extraordinary. So so the, the traditional media is no longer a tool for informing people. It's a tool of, of activism and social change. And that's fine, right, as long as it's advertised as that. But when you have these journalists that claim that their role is indispensable for the functioning of democracy. Well, I don't see much evidence of that. And the reason why podcasts and, and YouTube and, and independent creators are becoming more and more popular is because most people tend to agree, right? Yeah. Individuals now have the ability to do research themselves in understanding what's going on in the world. Um, they have instant access to information from all across the world and all different sorts of sources, and they can make their own opinions about these issues, right? They don't need, um, on either side of politics, whether it's Fox or whether it's the New York Times, um, they, people are turning to independent creators and podcasts for that kind of information. The other, the other, there is actually a, also one, and I, and I mean, I've, I've gone on a bit of a rant, but there is, a, there is one positive as well. There's a few mm. positives. Which is that simply there was an assumption that people had insufficient attention spans, right? Because traditionally um, people in the television industry and so on would have politicians on for a few minutes every hour yeah. as kind of a social good, right? Like they saw it as, a, as an obligation to allow politicians to kind of speak and um, but they would do that for a minimum period of time because it really killed their ratings, right? No one wanted to see politicians when they wanted to watch, you know, their favourite sitcoms, right? So, but they did it nonetheless because they thought that that was necessary for, for public information. But what that trained politicians to do was to speak in sound bites, right? Like you have your three-word slogans and, mm -hmm. and all of that sort of stuff. And what podcasts are allowing people to do 
is twofold. One, people are realising that the general public has a long attention span if you're talking about something that is interesting and useful, right? So um, the Joe Rogan podcast goes three hours long, the by far and away the world's most popular podcast, and he talks to everyone from Nobel Prize winners right through to MMA fighters to comedians to whatever, and has a long discursive and entertaining discourse with with yeah. one another. And people who are, you know, driving the trucks or, or doing the dishes or whatever can listen to the podcast and get a deep sense of having learned something mm. um, and, and understand what people really think. And then when he does have politicians on, such as Tulsi Gabbard, Bernie Sanders, um, they can have a, a long discussion, really understand what they what they think about something, not just what the media says they think about something. And when they see that that disconnect, people make that connection. They realize, oh, I'm I'm seeing something through a filtered lens rather than hearing it from the individual direct. Uh, and that naturally, when they see the dis- the degree of distortion, that to often mean the total opposite of what an individual believes or says, um, then naturally people aren't going to be just, you know, particularly trustful of the media. So podcasts and, and YouTube and things like that have been extraordinarily good by and large. They are going in a more censorious direction. They're becoming more mainstream themselves over time. Um, but, but, but notwithstanding that, it is true that things are getting better as a result of that. What we're hearing that the the howling screams of a dying industry in, in and I, and I have a deep sense of of anguish for those large number of good journalists that are being put out of a job, um, particularly those who are kind of mid to late career who um, do stand for traditional media values and and would never I mean there are um, there are journalists who really have the highest levels of integrity, including at these institutions I mentioned. I mean, there's um, uh, David Sanger at the New York Times, who who does um, the national security, cybersecurity stuff for, for um, the New York Times. Incredible stories uncovered that you know he's worked on over the time, like the whole Stuxnet virus thing, where that infected the amazing stuff that you just wouldn't get in a clickbait kind of commentariat, yeah. right? Um, and so they're still around, but they are a dying breed and they're, they're the ones being put out to pasture because they're not the ones bringing in the dough. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. It's, for me, I'm just kind of like, oh, people just want to hear their own opinions and be in that echo chamber and that's what we're heading towards. That's that's what the truth is nowadays. Um it's yeah, is is there a possibility for for those key players that are you know hold that journalistic integrity to move to this new media landscape? Is there a possibility like some sort of hybrid model? Or? People are, people are crying out for it. I know that there are some media outlets that have tried to do that. Like so, for example, um, here in Australia, Crikey, which is sort of a left leaning, um, Crikey. Hmm? Crikey? Crikey. Crikey. Okay, different. Okay. Yeah, no. Crikey, mate. Crikey. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. there's, there's a media outlet called <laughs> Crikey, right? Um, and it's a kind of a left-leaning mm. um, kind of Labour-esque, Green-esque sort of um, media outlet. Uh, and, but they have some great journalists right, who I really like. And they set up an investigative journalism um, space, uh, which they've been trialling and they've come up with some interesting stories. Um, on all kinds of you know areas of potential corruption and maladministration and so on, but I, I find that that interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have, but, but it's very niche, and it's and it's something they're doing in addition to their core business model, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not like they've they set up their publishing house with this investigative journalism as a core bit. They they already had a subscription kind of base model with a with a significant revenue base and then as an additional thing they've put this in as kind of a luxury item. Um, so I suspect that until such time as um, they come up with a new business model where it appeals to people across the political spectrum, um, then I don't think we will we'll see much change. And, and in fact, this affects you know podcasts and YouTube as well. So for example, in one of the earlier um, podcasts that we did, 
I, I talked about Australia's relationship with, with China and the United States in the context of that competition, and I laid out the different kind of interest groups. Now, most people found that really informative when I was sort of describing you know, these different areas. But some people were kind of questioning, it's like, why aren't you, you know, getting in the outrage machine and taking a side and, and, you know, screaming at how evil China is. <laughs> I mean, I do that in all kinds of forums, right? Like, I'm obviously <laughs> very tough on China. Everybody knows this, right? But, uh, but uh, it is important to me that the people who are listening to this podcast feel educated about the subject. I can put forward my point of view, mm-hmm. but but it's, it's to be able to let people make up their own mind, you know, like I trust the audience and um, the people who, you know, who are journalists of the traditional school, they do that as well. They, they lay out the facts, they lay out the thing, they, they shine light in dark corners and they let the audience take care of it. Um, and also the, the, the line of political activism has become overwhelming. So, for example... Um, even in the presidential debates in the United States, you'll see the moderators jump in on one side or the other. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that at the last 2016 election for sure. Um, that would be unthinkable in previous generations, right? It's not, you know, the, the, the journalist's role is to inform the public, right? Um, not and to sway them. <laughs> not to sway them. I mean, you have commentators and, and um, opinion pieces just like everyone else, but it's, you know, the, the pursuit of truth is always the highest ideal, right? Mm. And that is no longer the case. So you, you wouldn't really call it media. You just call it broadcasting, right? You know, mm. it's like people are putting out their opinions and people kind of latch onto them like, like thing, you know, cogs in a wall that they're climbing. Uh, and as a result of that, they don't have uh, any anywhere near the the degree of, pedagogy, education, learning uh, that they once at least aspired to, if they, even if they, you know, we can be too nostalgic. You know, there, was, there was never a time of media nirvana, but uh, at least that, they had that as an ideal. Um, and, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it, they don't even pretend to have that anymore. I feel like people just remember the exception, more or less, and that's why we have these two extremes on either end. Um, and that's... Yeah, but most people, uh, I mean, some some of this is self-generated. So mm. um, in like the Twitter sphere, for example, if all you did was look at Twitter, you would have a very skewed view of what people care about and what people are thinking about day to day, right? Mm. And unfortunately, Twitter has become far and away, I think, the most influential tool for setting an agenda because it's instant, right? Yeah. So something is breaking, it breaks on Twitter and then everybody writes about it. Yeah. Um, and so the Twitter sphere, which has a very, I would say, fringe um, set of values if you were to distribute it, um, you know, that they have had an enormous impact on businesses and media and entertainment industry and um, company policies and, and and even public service, like so, they set this agenda. They make that the, they because you get hit by this outrage mob on Twitter. There is this feeling that that's what everyone believes, but they're actually a very small minority. They just happen to be very very vocal, um, and. Because of that, yeah, and because journalists rely on Twitter because it's all where breaking news happens, they're very active on it. So there is this kind of cultural impact that that, that particular mode of communication has had on that industry, where all journalists pretty much are on Twitter. Ergo, they listen to all the voices that are on Twitter. Ergo, they get the feedback loop that says, oh, this is what people believe and care about. Ergo, that's what's right and we'll expanded to that but the average person on the street they don't they don't think that way they have much more sensible like things to, that they care about day to day mm-hmm. and uh and so they can listen to podcasts and choose their own media without getting involved in the outrage machine so that, so one good thing about the changing media landscape is because we have more choice the average joe can you know escape from that world but if but if we if it was still just traditional media and social media, 
things would be much worse than they are. Like if we didn't have podcasts and YouTube and all of that sort of thing, but all we had was journalists who went on Twitter, listened to Twitter, then went and wrote their stories, all we would hear about every day is just the extremes of outrage. And then, and one thing that is positive about podcasts and YouTube and independent media is that to a degree, I mean, there are plenty of shock jocks on, on social media and, and, you know, we'll be one of them to a degree. Um, the There is an opportunity to escape from it. Um, so that's another thing about the rise of it. If you, if you take as fact that most people don't have the values of Twitter, right, um, that means that most people are looking for something else. Mm. Um, and, and this gives them an opportunity to find it. Mm. That makes me feel so much better because every time I see Twitter and see what's trending, I'm kind of like, is this something I should be caring about? Like, I have no idea what this is. Um, but then, again... Like, there's also a lot of tweets about K-pop for some reason. <laughs> that's always in the top five. And that doesn't necessarily mean everyone's caring about that. Um, yeah. 